Hey guys, how's it going? I'm Chet, and welcome to another instalment of Stealing Licks from Legends. This lick comes from a solo in one of my favourite songs called Homesick by the legendary Marcus King. And it's actually a solo that I covered a while ago on my YouTube channel, so I'd really appreciate it if you do go and check that out and let me know what you think. As for the lick itself, let's check out how that actually sounds. So here we go. Here it comes. Now, usually I like to show you guys stuff that I'm currently working on, but this is a lick that I already have in my vocabulary, and it's just too good not to share with you guys, so I thought I'd make this lesson. That means this time I won't be sharing with you guys how I went about transcribing it, because I've obviously got it all figured out already. Normally when I do show this part of the process, it's because I'm actually doing it in real time, and you get an idea of exactly what goes into learning a lick but I don't really see the point of faking it just to prove a point here. Instead, I'll be teaching you guys how to play the lick note for note, as well as having a tab on screen so you can follow along. We'll then analyze how the notes in the lick relate to the chord progression, so we can understand how the lick actually works. This will help us to figure out how to actually apply the lick to the different situations you might find yourself in when improvising. That actually brings me on to something I wanted to ask you guys. I've done a few videos which includes my process on how I transcribe lines and solos. Now my question is, is this something that you guys would like to see more of, or would you prefer that the videos are slightly shorter and less involved, and that I teach you the notes of the lick, for example, straight away? I'd really love to hear what you guys think in the comment section below, because I want these videos to be as clear and interesting for you as they can be. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's get started. So first off, check out how the lick sounds again in context of the actual solo, so you know exactly what we're going to be focusing on. I've changed the starting point, so it literally starts just before the lick now, so check this out. It sounds killer, right? And it's not just the lick itself, but it's the feel that he's playing the lick with. When you're learning a lick, studying the articulation that the guitar player is using is just as important as actually learning the notes itself. It allows you to get a way better understanding of the guitarist's playing style so that you can then adapt it to your own playing. So now I'm just going to demonstrate how to play the lick, first at tempo and then a little bit slower so you can hear the notes in isolation. Here goes. <laughs> So how to actually play this lick, and like I said, I'm not just going to teach you the notes, we're also going to discuss the dynamics and articulation he's using to get the effect of a vocalist almost singing with emotion. So here goes, he starts off by using a quick percussive scratch just before the lick starts to provide a sense of groove and rhythm to the phrase straight away, and he does this by muting the strings with his left hand and doing an upstroke with his right hand, aiming for the thinner strings which have a little bit more attack and treble. Just like that. The next note is the ninth fret on the D string, played with the ring finger on the fretting hand and a downstroke on the picking hand. Now that acts as a lead into the next note, which is the ninth fret on the G string. Now the dynamics of this note, if we listen to the track, he's hitting that note with so much emphasis that you can almost feel the resonance of the semi-hollow guitar that he's using. And by doing this, he's really making use of dynamics to give us a sense of a vocalist actually singing a melody with emotion. So, so far we've got this. Now, after he's hit that ninth fret with a lot of emphasis, he then hammers to the 11th fret on the G string with the ring finger. He then follows that up by bending the 11th fret up and down by a semitone before pulling off to the ninth fret on the first finger. So, so far we have this. After the ninth fret on the G string, you then hammer to the 11th fret without picking again. And notice that when you hammer on to the 11th fret, the note is quite short and staccato, which adds extra tension to the phrase. It also trails off in volume, giving a sense of that phrase ending. After this, he keeps the dynamics quite subdued, and he does a slide from the 9th fret to the 11th fret on the D string, using the ring finger of the fretting hand and a downstroke on the picking hand. As he gets to the 11th fret, the notes almost immediately stops, and this provides a little bit of breathing room before he reverses the motion and does his slide back from the 11th fret to the 9th fret. He then pulls off to the 7th fret, 
And on the next note, which is the ninth fret of the D string being picked, he adds a little bit more emphasis again, allowing it to peak out of the phrase. And it really gives it a sense of rhythm and motion. After that, he rolls the ring finger to the ninth fret of the A string, dropping the volume momentarily. And then again, after that, he raises the volume on the seventh fret of the D string with the first finger. So, so far, that part of the phrase, we have this. And you can see that A string ninth fret was almost inaudible, and it really gives it that sense of swing and motion. Now, to help memorize the lick, I would call everything we've done up till now section one. And that's just to help me compartmentalize it and break the lick down into smaller chunks, which is easier to digest. So, I'll play section one all the way through. Section two of the lick is actually my favorite part because he makes such good use of rhythm and dynamics to add extra tension into the phrase. And he does this by speeding up his playing and playing the notes with real precision. So, it starts off with a slide from the ninth fret to the 11th fret on the D string with the ring finger and a downstroke on the picking hand. The next note is the ninth fret of the G string, played with the first finger of the fretting hand and another downstroke on the picking hand. Following this, you want to play another ninth fret on the B string this time, but you don't want the notes to bleed into each other, so you have to make sure that you roll the first finger properly. And to play that with your picking hand is another downstroke. Now we've just done three downstrokes in a row, and this is called economy picking. And to do this properly, what you need to do is after you pick the first string, so in this case the D string, you then want to rest on the next string that you're going to pick. So you're resting now on the G string. Now once you pick the G string, you then rest on the next string, which is the B string. And that's how you do economy picking. You pick the first string and rest on the next note until you're ready to pick it. What that does is it ensures that there's no bleed between each note and provides the most efficient motion in your right hand. After that, you're going to do an upstroke with the little finger playing the 12th fret on the B string. So the phrase is going quickly and it abruptly stops on the 12th fret. And that's the peak of tension in this phrase. After that, he then pulls off from the 10th fret to the 9th fret using his middle finger and first finger in his fretting hand and a downstroke on the picking hand. So, so far in section two, we have this. He then does an upstroke on the 11th fret G string with the ring finger of the fretting hand. And then a pull off to the 9th fret on the G string. And that's the end of section 2. Section 3 starts off with a sharp slide from the 12th fret to the 14th fret on the B string using a ring finger. And then a hammer from the 10th fret to the 12th fret, first finger to the ring finger on the fretting hand. And a downstroke on the picking hand. Now the dynamics are really important here because the quick slide from the 12th fret to the 14th fret followed by the pause leaves the listener wanting to hear that sense of resolution which comes from the 10th fret to the 12th fret hammer. Now he almost tricks the listener here by continuing on the phrase slightly longer than is expected and he also makes great use of dynamics again to get that sense of a vocalist singing a melody and adding emotion in it. He does this by pulling off after the hammer to the 10th fret and reducing the volume before sliding down to the 9th fret. After that, he then emphasises that same note by picking it again with a higher volume. He does the same thing again on the 9th fret of the G string, first picking it lightly, and then picking it with more attack. He then finishes off the phrase by hammering to the 11th fret on the G string with the ring finger while cutting the note slightly short. And there you go, that's the whole lick. So I'll just play section three in its entirety now. Now what we can do is play section one, two, and three back to back to complete the whole lick. And it sounds like this. there you go, that's how to play the complete lick. So you can see that learning this lick involves much more than just playing the notes. It's really important to think about the feel and how the notes are played, which at the end of the day encompasses Marcus King's style, which he's developed from listening to his heroes. By analysing how he's using these techniques, 
You can adapt them by applying them to your own lines or others that you previously learnt. And before you know it, you'll be adding another dimension to your playing, which you can evolve and develop into your own playing style. Okay, so we've learnt the notes and we've analysed how he actually articulates the lick. Now we're going to try and understand why the notes sound so good over this chord progression, so that we can then apply it to other musical situations. The solo section is pretty much just a two chord vamp, moving from C sharp minor 7 to D major 7. The lick we've learnt is predominantly on the D major 7 chord, so the majority of the analysis will be focused here, but there is a definite sense of movement towards the end of the lick and a seamless transition into the C sharp minor 7 chord, so we'll also be checking out how he does that. Now with knowledge of the harmonised major scale, I'm interpreting this 2 chord vamp as a movement between the minor 3, C sharp minor 7, to the major 4, D major 7. Now I know this because in the harmonised major scale, you only ever get a minor 7 chord, followed by a major 7 chord, a semitone above, when you're moving from the 3 to the 4 in the key. So that means the D major 7 chord is the 4 chord in the key of A, and has the notes D, F sharp, A, and C sharp. The lick starts off playing an A major pentatonic blues lick across two positions of the cage system. So we have this. <laughs> That first half belongs to this shape. The second half starts off in the first shape and then moves to here. Now we're in the key of A, so naturally these notes are going to sound really good. Now in section 2, where the lick starts to speed up, he really begins to add some spice to the lick. And he does this by playing an A major 7 arpeggio, over the D major 7 chord. So he's superimposing the 1 chord of the key over the 4 chord of the key. So here's our D major 7 chord. And here's the A major 7 arpeggio. So let's look at why this works. The notes of an A major 7 chord, we have A, C sharp, E, and G sharp. Now the intervals that we obtain by doing this relative to the D major 7 chord, A is the 5th of D major 7, C sharp is the 7, E is the 9th, and G sharp is actually the sharp 11. So you can see we're adding some pretty cool colour tones just by playing an A major 7 chord on top of a D major 7 chord. It's worth noting that the sharp 11 extension of the D major 7 chord really highlights the sound of the Lydian mode, which is the mode that's obtained from the 4th note of the major scale. But if modes don't make sense to you yet, don't worry, just subscribe to the channel and keep an eye on my music theory series because I'll be covering modes in future videos. For now, just treat the Lydian mode as a really airy fairy sounding major scale and that's because of the distance of a tone between the third of the mode and the sharp four. So what we've got so far in this section is the A major 7 arpeggio up to this point. He then adds the note B, which is the 12th fret on the B string. So he's dipping back into the A major pentatonic scale and this note is the 13th relative to the D major 7 chord. So he's adding another extension into his lick here. So you can see that even though what he's playing seems physically quite simple to do, and it's actually not so bad to think about, it's actually providing you with some really sophisticated colour tones and adding a lot of spice to give some extra kick to this lick. Now immediately, what we can take from this section is two really cool devices that can be used to add these colour tones without having to think too much. The first one, being playing a major pentatonic scale in the key of the song over the 4 chord. By doing that, you'll be playing the 5, the 13, the 7, 9 and 3 over that chord. So it's a really cool scale to play and immediately get those colours. Then, by playing a major 7 arpeggio in the key of the song over the 4 chord, we also add in the sharp 11, giving us that Lydian sound. In section 3, he's aiming to target the chord change to the C sharp minor 7 chord. And he does this by landing on the flat 7 of that chord, which is the note B again. And that's this section. He then dives into the C sharp minor pentatonic scale, which obviously fits the chord perfectly. We've got C sharp minor 7. And he's moving into position 1 of the C sharp minor pentatonic scale. And that's this part of the lick. Now the key part here is making the chord transition seamless while still highlighting the chord tone of the next chord. He does this by making use of the fact 
that the note B that he's targeting is both the 9 of the D major 7 chord and the flat 7 of the C sharp minor 7 chord. The listener's ear is already used to him playing that pitch, so as a result, the line has a really nice flow across the chords. Right, so now that we've learnt the lick and analysed why it sounds good, I'm going to give you an insight into how you can actually use it over other chord progressions. Now it's unlikely that you're going to find yourself in a situation where both the tempo, the chord progression and the key are exactly the same as the track. So you won't always necessarily be able to play the lick in its entirety from start to finish. That's also not the aim of learning vocabulary in the first place. Sure, at first we learn everything note for note exactly as played by our heroes. That allows us to get comfortable with the lick. But eventually, what we want to do is make that lick our own. Now in this case, I've broken down the lick to focus on my favourite part, which is where he's playing the A major 7 arpeggio with the added 9 over the 4 chord to add all those spicy extensions. I've taken just this part because number 1, it's short enough to be played around with in a variety of different musical scenarios, and number 2, it's actually really easy to get into and out of this lick which allows me to blend it into my improvising in a more natural way. Now how to actually use this fragment of the lick? Well, clearly we could do exactly what Marcus King is doing and make sure that we're playing a major 7 arpeggio from the root note of the 1 chord in the key over the 4 chord. By doing this, we're going to start implying exactly the same colour tones in our own lines. But bear in mind, this is not the only situation that this lick can be played in. At the end of the day, this small fragment is just a major 7 lick so it can be played wherever it makes sense to play a major 7 arpeggio. It might end up having a different character or quality to the sound, but it will definitely work. For example, we can simply play this A major 7 lick over an A major 7 chord, and it will highlight the chord tones perfectly. We could even play the lick starting on the minor 3rd of a minor 7 chord to imply the sound of a minor 9 chord. So for example, if in a chord progression we had an F sharp minor 7 chord, we could play this major 7 lick starting from the minor 3rd, which is the note A. This would give us the notes A, C sharp, E and G sharp, where G sharp is the added 9. So there's loads of different things you can do with just this small fragment of the lick, and being able to work out how and where you can apply it in a more advanced way will require you to have a strong grasp of your music theory. So there you go, there's just a few ideas of how you might be able to adapt this lick and make it your own. For now, I'll just be demonstrating how I use this lick in the exact same way Marcus King does just in a different key. That means I'll be playing that major 7 lick in the key of the backing track over a 4 chord. Make sure you take note of how I'm trying to use this lick in a seamless way by blending it in with the notes both before and after. By working on this, you'll really begin to assimilate it into your improvising and make it your own. So check this out. <laughs> Right, so there you go, a new lick to work on and two new devices that you can use to add some awesome colour tones to your playing. Number one, playing the major 7 arpeggio off of the 1 chord over the 4 chord of the key to add the extensions of a 9 and a sharp 11. Number two, playing the major pentatonic scale in the key of the track over the 4 chord to introduce the 13. I hope you guys enjoy messing about with these ideas and remember, make sure you have fun when playing around and experimenting. That's what it's all about. But that's it for this time, guys. If you enjoyed this content and gained something from the lesson, I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel and give the video a like. Don't forget to also press the bell notification icon down below so you're the first to know when future videos are out. Till next time, I'll catch you later. Mm -hmm.